Hi, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Herbert. In this presentation, we're going to discuss how brain-based neuroscience and ergonomics merge in an effort to understand the problems faced by all people who sit every day at their job, whether you be at the home or at the office. To understand how to promote health, efficiency, and productivity in the workplace, there are three factors that are critical. First is the health and well-being of the person. Second is the seating that that person uses, it being the direct interface for that person in the workspace. And third, it's crucial for any seating design to take into account human neurology and biomechanical function. Let's have a listen to some leading people within the ergonomic field and their perspective of what is needed to be effective and efficient regarding seating design. Ian Corlett, in the preface of Hard Facts About Soft Machines, and I paraphrase, the sitter's environment, the biomechanics, and the physiology of the occupant need to be better explored when designing seat models that are truly ergonomic. Yutaka Haruki and Masao Suzuki, Hard Facts About Soft Machines. The chair directly affects awareness by its shape, color, or feel. At the same time, the chair affects our posture, and this posture influences our awareness. Amy Cuddy, in her TED Talk. We are also promoting optimal feeling with optimal posture because emotion and feeling and posture are literally two sides of one coin. Dr. Jennifer Pint, movement and sitting, it's all about your health. Moving while sitting is essential to health. Incidental activity improves body metabolism and has been shown to impact positively on heart function, diabetes, and waist measurement. The spinal joints and discs also benefit from movement because of the load on them is alternated. Waste products are removed and nutrition is improved. Alternating movements between muscle groups is essential to avoid fatigue in one set of muscles with resultant pain. Taking all of this into account, what factors of the seated posturing process need to be examined to create a healthier experience for the occupant? Keeping in mind that, you know, the second most important piece of equipment in the office is the chair. The first is the operator. Ergonomics is defined as man's relationship to work. Bionomics is the study of man's relationship to his environment. The environment we're gonna talk about right now is the seated workspace. And the title of this presentation is Bionomics, Homeostasis in Ergonomics. Peak human efficiency is achieved by having an optimal interaction of balance between the internal and external environments. The goal is to have the internal environment operating at highest efficiency, thus allowing the mind-body to direct maximum conscious attention towards the external environment, namely the task at hand. A central concept of the bionomic paradigm is that the organism is seen as adaptive and consistently moving towards a physiological homeostatic state. To view the organism in the context of its environment, there are some qualities of the organism that are presupposed. One. The human organism is adaptive. Two, it is proactive in the context of life. That is, it effectively moves towards homeostasis. Three, it is geotropic. That is, it is directly influenced and grows directionally to gravity. Integrated. Now, understanding the bionic paradigm, we're going to actually move forward and discuss gravity's influence on structural posturing. In the field of ergonomics, much has been discussed about lordosed or kyphosed postures, standing versus sitting, flexion, extension, and all of the above are really valid questions in the context of content. But what we really want to actually work with is the process. How do we attend to gravity? How do we process gravity? That's what we're going to actually get into now. Gravitropism. Everything the body becomes is directly or indirectly influenced by gravitational force. We commonly regard plants as geotropic, moving directionally or growing in response to gravitational forces, but humans are also geotropic, with gravity being the main constant and consistent force they are subjected to. In keeping with content versus process, Let's discuss geotropism versus sensory motor integration. Essentially, geotropism is the content where the sensory motor integration pro is the process of living within a geotropic environment.
Sensory motor integration plays a key role in posture, movement control, and locomotion. In an environment containing gravitational forces that vary with body orientation and configuration, how does the human frame adapt and integrate to these forces? Let's start with movement. As you can see, there are two categories, autonomic, intrinsic, and voluntary or conscious. The one that we're going to be dealing with here is the autonomic one. How does this apply to homeostasis and efficiency of the human in a gravity environment? Sensory motor is an act of receiving and processing external information to then elicit a motor response. Proprioception is the sense of relative position of the muscle and ligaments to incoming information regarding external forces. The mechanism credited with monitoring and directing of posture in the human organism were referred to as the Autonomic Sensory Motor Proprioceptive System, or ASPS. As with any musical orchestra, our neurological orchestra of sensory motor tone has players and performs a tune called proprioception or posture. Like a conductor in an orchestra, the vestibular nuclear complex, or the VNC, is a controller and interpreter of all signals involved in the orchestra of proprioception. It is this point where the signals from the first first chairs, the three first chairs, the visual system, the vestibular system, and the cervical somatosensory systems converge so they may be registered and proactively acted upon. The vestibular system is specially designed to maintain adequate postural tone in muscles of the trunk and extremities to provide overall support and balance for the body during posturing and locomotion. The visual system plays a prominent role in the proprioceptive orchestra there are three pairs of extraocular muscles of the visual system. The proprioceptive receptors of the extraocular musculature play a dominant role in the guidance of movements. An interesting side note is that the anatomical planes of the vestibular semicircular canals physically align with the planes of the visual extraocular muscles. The three pairs of extraocular muscles of the visual system link neurologically to each of the three semicircular canals of the vestibular system so that the messages can be relayed between the two systems to affect the postural changes to provide gaze stability. The cervical spine, especially the upper cervical spine, is the most mobile part of the vertebral column. There is a particularly high density of proprioceptor mechanoreceptors in the cervical spine muscles of the three uppermost cervical segments. This dense network of mechanoreceptors in the soft tissues of the region, this region gives the CNS information about the vertical and horizontal orientation of the head with respect to the rest of the body. Besides the high density of mechanoreceptors attached to them, these top three segments are the only ones in the spinal column with direct connection to the vestibular nuclear complex. Somatosensory information from the cervical region is the only region that has this direct access to the sense of balance and the sense of sight. Combined together, these elements keep or hold and maintain the vertical and horizontal orientation of the head with respect to the rest of the body. At the CNS integration point, this is where the higher brain centers come in in the cortex, the conscious moment-to-moment -moment decisions to execute desired movements to achieve desired outcomes uh, are then implemented within the system. Next in the flowchart are the midline muscular systems that control the autonomic biomechanical posturing. These are responsible for the efficient interaction with gravity. Next are the low threshold proprioceptors or mechanoreceptors that give detailed and continuous sensory information about the orientation and position of the head, spine, and other body parts. This is essential to the accurate performance of complex movements. Also, there is the recurrent meningeal nerve that runs the full length of the central canal and enters the spinal canal via the posterior branch of the spinal nerve root. It innervates the dural meninges, constantly monitoring the tension and torsion and hydrostatic pressure of the meninges. This flow chart illustrates the elements and sequence of events of the ASPS. You can essentially influence any one of these components and affect the process of posturing. In ergonomics, there's been a new interest in adopting of standing workstations. This interest arises from the generally accepted idea that the standing posture is somehow beneficial for the body. It's important, therefore, to examine what might be the likely reason why the body can function efficiently in its erect stance.
and translate this understanding to the seated posture. Being born into a gravitational environment and being geotropic by nature, a baby enters this world unequipped to be able to cope with these forces and in response the ASPS creates adaptations to our body or spinal curvatures to resist the one atmosphere compressive force of gravity. Let's have a look at this. So basically we start with the primary curvatures. When a baby is born, basically they come up with one C shape. Excuse my drawing, it looks pretty distorted, but that's the way it is. Put the gravitational line in here, and you can see that there's basically one major curve. Over time, as little Bobby or Susie gains strength, and you know, there's always a mother out there who can who sits there and look, oh look at the baby, his head's actually adapt, you know, getting stronger, he's looking at things. We can pretty much use that or actually see that as being the cranial elements of the ASPS adapting or going through sensory motor integration and creating the curvatures in an effort to be able to um, adapt and, and move in gravity. By the time 12 months rolls around, we actually can see that the ASPS has actually created three load-bearing systems or three curvatures and what this does is this creates a one atmosphere compressive force resistance so that we can actually move with this in the, within the environment. By the time of generally 12 months, the ASPS has now completed its adaptation and we can now see three distinct load-bearing sections of the spine. This allows the child to stand efficiently. Without these curves or without this curvature development, we as people could not be mobile. When we look at the configuration of the spine in an upright standing posture and overlay the gravity load-bearing line, we can now see three distinctive load-bearing systems that are the three regions of the spine. By developing these three load-bearing systems, the spine's overall gravitational resistance is significantly enhanced. To view how the autonomic sensory motor proprioceptive system monitors and adjusts the load-bearing configuration of the spine in response to gravity, Let's view this from a mechanical engineering perspective using the Euler column formula. The Euler column formula is an engineering formula used to measure like critical load of load bearing systems. The three elements of the Euler column formula when applied to the ASPS's spinal curve development produce a structure with the resilience equal to that of one atmosphere compressive gravitational force. The three elements that are uh, part of the Euler column formula are one, a moment of inertia or torque, two, the effective length of that load-bearing system, and three, the eccentric load of the load-bearing system. A moment of inertia or torque can be understood by using the bottom of the load-bearing column, which has a curve coming off of it, or a bend, and by applying compressive force, you can elicit a torque or rotation off of the center of uh, the gravity line. With this, there is a moment or a lever force commonly known as torque. Let's demonstrate this. So to demonstrate a moment of torque, basically let's view the stick as a, a column, a com you know, and we're going to add compression to this stick. So we're going to use compressive force, and if you notice the actual bending aspect, but at the bottom, at the very bottom, basically down here, what you can see is there is a torsion or a rotation or a torque, a rotation torque, um, at the base of this column. Now, in doing this, it also adds two other components that we're going to talk about later. One of them is called the effective length of a, of a curvature, which is this point to this point. And then there is the imaginary, it's called eccentric load, but that eccentric load is the distance from here to that imaginary gravitational line that sits through here. But to, again, to reiterate, this mo moment here, or this lever force, is generally found in the context of the spine where like C6 is, or T12, L5S1. These are generally the areas where we get this motion happening and this springiness. So, what I'm going to demonstrate now, which is kind of dramatic, is that if we had one curvature over the column, over the, the length of the spine, like the baby does when, when it's first born, let's see what actually would happen. As you can see, 
for an inanimate object, not so good. But with regards to actually creating three load-bearing systems, or actually three curvatures, it increases that resistance so that that wouldn't happen. Next are the effective length and the eccentric load. Note in the picture on the right, the effective length for the curves is the distance from the top of the curve to the bottom. For example, for, uh, in the cervical region, it's occiput to C7. In the thoracic region, it's T1 to T12. And for the lumbar region, it's generally L1 to S2. The shaded areas represent the eccentric loading of each section. And when we look at the spine in an erect standing posture and overlay the gravity load bearing line, the effective length and the eccentric load are basically in an efficient configuration. Also, the points at which these curves transition from one to the other are free and movable and their moments or torques are optimized. Now to recap kind of what we're going through with regards to the spine and its actual curvature development, we're looking at the three components, which is basically the effective length of the load bearing systems. Again, basically these three systems are like this. The moments of torque, which are right here, which is that spring loaded aspects of the spine, which you have the rotation around it. And what this does is this allows a springiness within the actual spine in a gravity weight bearing environment because basically the gravity load by the line goes through here and it creates kind of that springiness aspect. The spine in this erect efficient posture now allows the actual brain to do something that is critical for its existence and that is primary respiration. We'll have a look at what that is right now. The primary respiratory mechanism is in constant rhythmic cyclical motion. The movement of the brain and the spinal cord, the cerebral spinal fluid, meninges, and bones are synchronous, and their movement together forms one large integrated unit of function. This movement facilitates endocrine and physiological processes critical to the healthy functioning of the brain and its surrounding tissues. Any interference with this rhythm can cause psychological and neural dysfunction. There are five key elements of primary respiration. One, inherent motility of the brain and spinal cord. Two, the flow of the cerebral spinal fluid. Three, the motion of the dural membrane itself. Four, the articular mobility of the bones of the cranium. And five, the articular mobility of the sacrum between the ilia. The inherent motility of the brain and the spinal cord is an innate undulating rhythmic motion uh, and it has a flexion extension um, component which helps facilitate the flow of cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid flow helps with clearing of waste products and also helps with the transport of hormones from the pituitary gland. The dural membrane is under constant tension. This tension is reciprocal because if there is a pull on one end of the membrane, the pull is transmitted throughout the length of the membrane. The membranes are anchored firmly to the base of the skull and to the sacrum to form a core link between the two structures and links their synchronous movement. There are 26 bones in the head or skull and they are all in slight rhythmic motion with the central nervous system, the cerebral spinal fluid, the membranes, and the sacrum. These bones all fit together like gears of a watch and influence each other. With the dural membrane attached to the base of the skull and the sacrum, the innate motion of the cranial contents is transmitted to the sacrum. The cranium and the sacrum work together as a unit. In the upright erect posture, the sacrum is free to move in the normal flexion extension rhythm. This motion is critical to the health and well-being of the person. Newly discovered glymphatic system or glymphatic clearance pathway is a waste clearance pathway for the central nervous system. Exchange of fluids is partially driven by the primary respiratory expansion and contraction of the brain and surrounding tissues. Speaking of spinal dynamics and lymphatic movement, it's interesting that the transition of the curves or the inflection points of the spine are the demarcation points of the lymphatomes, which are the drainage directions of the lymphatic system. The standing posture. 
This posture's efficiency comes from its load-bearing efficiency as the elements of the Euler column formula are, are optimized. This helps facilitate the reduction of the stresses and strains exerted on the spine and its contents. It also must be noted that the primary respiratory mechanism is free to perform its essential role to contribute to the health and well-being of the person also. Okay, let's recap. We acknowledge that the human is an adaptive, proactive, and geotropic organism. Sensory motor integration is an ongoing process that has an autonomic element in the context of spine. And the autonomic sensory motor proprioceptive system, through its elements, directs the development and maintenance of spinal curvatures in an effort to be balanced and efficient with gravity. Also, by adopting these curves, it underpins the critical and essential process of primary respiration. Also, our ergonomic friends all agree that the biomechanics and the physiology of the occupant is of importance and that the chair has an effect on our posture and our emotional state. Also, and more importantly, that movement is essential for the person sitting. I agree that movement is essential while seated. Keeping this in mind, it will be the focus as we next will address the current negatives that are experienced in the modern seated posture. So, this whole physiologically efficient process kind of looks like this. The mechanoreceptors from the spine feed new information to the VNC, the vestibular system, the extraocular musculature, and the cervical somatosensory system. They assess the orientation of the head and adapt it to maintain vertical and horizontal orientation. This information is then sent over to the CNS where it's integrated with the desired activity and the new motor commands are sent to the involuntary musculature of the spine where they contract or relax as needed and then the mechanoreceptors or proprioceptors of the spine register the new movements and this process goes on and on and on and on. So here we have a quote, a whole spine quote. Disorders of the Cervical Spine by John Bland MD, Professor of Medicine, University of Vermont College, basically stating that you cannot affect one area of the spine without affecting the other. In other words, we, we tend to um, divide the spine into components, but in actuality, if you affect the lower back or the spine or the sacrum, you affect the neck. If you affect the neck, you affect the lower back and vice versa. No more obvious where this relationship can actually be seen is when you see someone sitting in a chair or an office chair. So let's talk about the process of sitting. When the body moves from an erect posture of standing to the sitting position, the very first contact with the support structure of the chair is made with the ischial tuberosities of the pelvis. As seen in the picture, the compacting forces or the gravity forces pass through the ischial tuberosities and the sacroiliac joint. Immediately after the initial contact with the C-pan, the pelvis rocks backwards onto the coccyx to give rise to a condition referred to as the triune pelvic pedestal syndrome. The modern seated posture forces gravity load-bearing line forward, causing your shoulders to roll forward. It thrusts the head forward on the spine and forces the whole body to respond. At the beginning of this uh, presentation, I talked about some incidental movement and how ergonomics, in ergonomics, they talk about dynamic movement. What we're going to do is I'm going to show you and demonstrate an incidental movement that actually happens when people sit. And it happens at a very critical part of the body, which is basically the pelvis, uh, which is the foundation of this house, so to speak. Um, if the stumps are bad, the walls crack. And if the walls are cracking, the roof starts to leak. And same thing is with the spine. If the pelvis is out of, or out of alignment or asymmetrical in its load bearing, the back, the mid back starts to spasm and tighten up. The biomechanics alters and things go downhill from there really quickly. So here we have a person standing and starting to execute the process of sitting. When they go down, the issue of tuberosities contact the actual seat pan. There's a 90 degree angle and they rock back onto the coccyx. And when they want to restand, they have to lean forward, bring the coccyx forward, center, take the center of gravity from the head over the anchor points at the feet and raise up. 
and that's the process of creating the triune pelvic pedestal syndrome. So knowing what we know now about the Euler column formula and those uh, components like the effective length, the eccentric load, and the moments and torques, all of those things are going to be thrown into uh, disarray. The effective length in the regions are going to dramatically change. The eccentric loading in all three regions dramatically changes. The moments or torques at the inflection points or those transition points in the spine, they increase. The gravitational load bearing line is deviated from optimum and is now asymmetrical. All these things start to affect the actual musculature of the spine, creating an asymmetrical load bearing pattern which the uh, autonomic sensory motor proprioceptive system has to deal with. Another quote, Alf Brieg in 1978 coined the term adverse mechanical cord tension or AMCT. Brieg found that from biomechanical aspect the spinal cord cannot be considered in isolation but must be treated as a continuous tract of nervous and supportive tissues. Hence, the transmission of tension in one section of the spinal cord will automatically be transmitted to the rest of the length of the spinal cord itself. So, with Briggs understanding, and as the sacrum plays a crucial role in the execution of the primary respiratory response, in the seated posture when the TPPS or the triune pelvic pedestal syndrome exists, the normal flexion and extension of the sacrum is inhibited. The resulting inhibition of the normal cerebral spinal fluid flow in turn alters the hydrostatic pressure, lymphatic drainage, and impacts the efficient functioning of the autonomic sensory proprioceptive system. The deviation away from the optimal dynamic of the lower lumbar and pelvis translates up to the upper portions of the spine to affect the dynamics of the spine. The position of the head in modern seating is problematic to say the least. Rene Calais, MD, used an example where a patient has an unbalanced forward head posture. Dr. Calais assigns the head a weight of 10 pounds and displaces the head's center of gravity forward by three inches. Now his calculations are the required counterbalancing muscle contraction on the opposite side of the fulcrum, which is the upper back or the vertebra, would be 30 pounds. So in other words, for every inch forward of displacement by the head, there is a 10 pounds compressive force felt. Chronic inefficient seating leads to an inflammation cascade. This destructive process is a result of asymmetrical biomechanic neurological dysfunction of the modern sitting posture. It affects the overall sensory motor integration process by supporting the constant muscle contraction required to balance the postural distortions that create muscle fatigue and myofascial pain syndromes. Dr. Calais states, this increase in muscle tension not only is fatiguing, but acts as a compressive force on the soft tissues, including the disc. Dr. Calais explains how the constant contraction in the counterbalancing muscles creates a cascade that leads to muscle fatigue, inflammation, fibrosis, and eventually to chronic musculoskeletal pain syndromes. It's clear that the modern seated posture from an ergonomic view and a neuroscience view is inefficient and compromising to the human being's physical and neurophysiological health. From all that we've covered, it's clear that sitting can and does have a deep and destructive effect. And yet, there's one more thing from the science of neuroplasticity. The brain's way of healing. Remarkable discoveries and recoveries from the frontiers of neuroplasticity by Norman Doidge, MD, 2015. And I quote, Thoughts, memories, perceptions, learning, skill, humanism, are not encoded in specific neurons or even in the connections between the neurons, but in the cumulative electrical wave patterns that are the result of all the neurons firing together. It is like an orchestral musical piece. As people become immobile, they see less, hear less, and process less new information, and their brains begin to atrophy from the lack of stimulation. The neuroplastic systems require physical movement to generate new cells and nerve growth factor. So, from Dr. John Bland's quote, we now understand that we need to address the spine from a whole spine perspective. 
To affect one region of the spine is to affect them all. We also know that the modern seated posture, by causing the rocking backwards of the pelvis onto the coccyx, results in the triune pelvic pedestal syndrome, using the ischial tuberosities and the coccyx as three points of support. This compromises the load bearing of the spine, creating gravitational inefficiency and instability throughout the spine. Then the ASPS has to address this instability by adjusting the contraction and relaxation of the individual and involved muscle groups in order to stabilize. This leads to the resultant chronic muscular tension and inflammation with the long-term result of the tissue losing its elasticity created by this inefficient posture. This posture concurrently creates the condition of adverse mechanical cord tension, restricting the essential primary respiratory response and the resultant glymphatic, neurological, and physiological dysfunction with the person's health, well-being, and productivity being compromised. Asymmetrical load bearing equals muscle spasm or chronic muscle tension. That creates the inflammation cascade, which increases a production of fibroplasts and decreases the elasticity of the tissue. That creates a decrease in ability of movement, decreases the primary respiratory response, decrease the neural stimulation needed, decreases neuroplasticity, decreases the ability to process information, you get where I'm going here, decreases cognitive function, decreases productivity. Debates of whether we should sit or stand at the office are ongoing. Yet none of them have taken into account the neuroscience and the neurophysiology of the occupant of the chair. As we've pointed out, the modern seated posture has its shortcomings. But what about the standing craze that is currently being touted as the solution to the modern seating dilemma? Let's refer back to our whiteboard. So here we are back at our whiteboard. And what we want to talk about now are uh, anchor points and in relation to seating and in, in relation to standing and how that affects this gravity weight bearing line and the effective length and eccentric load. So come on, let's back. When we're looking at this, if you remember correctly, we're dealing with three load bearing systems with their effective length, which is through here, effective length, and the eccentric load, which is here. Now, as an anchor point being the seat where the issue of tuberosity sit down on, we can understand, see how that actually can be efficient and working through. When we're dealing with standing though, we've got to actually look at the second anchor point, which is down below, we take the legs, it's down here. Now when you're looking at this from that perspective, you have to take into two more weight bearing systems. So you've got one, two, three. The fourth one is the sacrum, which if you look at the angle curves down to the ischial tuberosities. And the, th the fifth one, is actually the one here with the legs. Now, here you have the eccentric or the effective length of it, and here you have the eccentric load. Now you can see the eccentric load is quite greater than the actual uh, one with standing. Now, when you're standing, there is no eccentric load to actually uh, make the biomechanics efficient. But if you're looking at this point, let's say here, being the knee, and you, you draw a line straight through, you can see that what we're dealing with now is a trunk to thigh angle of 100 plus degrees. That maintains the gravitational line and the gravitational integrity. The one thing that's important here also is to find is that if we start to reduce this back to a 90 degree angle, like modern seated posture does, or the modern seated you know, chairs that are there out there, and if you look on the net, there's replete with this is how you should sit. What it does is it has a force feedback mechanism which forces the pelvis backwards, rocking back onto the coccyx and creating the triune pelvic pedestal syndrome. To wrap up, the modern seated posture at a 90 degree angle creates uh, biomechanical alterations and inefficiencies which start to inhibit the primary respiratory mechanism which is essential for health and well-being of the occupant.
The standing posture creates an inefficiency in the biomechanical aspects because of the lack of eccentric load. The 100 degree or 100 and plus degree angle in, in the trunk to thigh angle is the posture which one maintains primary respiratory response, efficient biomechanics, and maintains the health and well being of the occupant. From my experience, a couple of things in the seating design need to be achieved. Firstly, the thigh to trunk angle must be 100 plus degrees. To reduce this below 100 plus is to have a force feedback up the legs to push the pelvis back onto the coccyx and create the triune pelvic pedestal syndrome, initiating all the effects of that destru destructive syndrome. Next, the seat pan must have a center pivot mechanism. That is, the adjustment of the tilt is directly over the center of gravity. This must allow tilt forward and tilt backwards. This takes into account the anterior and posterior movement of the pelvis rotating around the center of gravity at sacrum and allows the occupant to adjust to get their individual setting. This facilitates the upper portions of the spine to move freely and balanced. Below is an x-ray of a person seated with the thigh to trunk angle at 100 plus degrees. As you can see, it maintains the load-bearing integrity, maintains the primary respiratory response by doing that, and reduces the upper back chronic muscular strain. This slide shows the SEMG scan results of a male taken six minutes apart. The bottom row is indicative of what the scan results showed at the modern seated posture where the trunk to thigh angle was at 90 degrees. You can see the amplitude was quite high and the asymmetry was off the chart. The next row above that is actually taken with the trunk to thigh angle at 100 plus degrees and you can see the significant change in the, in the uh, amplitude and the asymmetry resulting in a significant reduction of uh, chronic muscle tension and muscle spasm. According to ergonomic statistics over 65 percent of sitting employees suffer from some combination of neck, upper back, and shoulder pain. These statistics are based upon the number of claims filed with HR and RSK groups. Ergonomics has been searching for the solution to the chronic problems faced by people who sit at the workplace for decades, and yet the problem continues to plague the person who sits for the majority of their work life. While standing is thought to be the most physiologically efficient, it can only be achieved by having the seat pen place the pelvis in the standing configuration. The benefits to the person's neurology and spinal biomechanics can then be translated to the upper portions of the spine and head. It's clear that when you address this problem with the input of neuroscience and mechanical engineering, the answer is to maintain the trunk to thigh angle at 100 plus degrees. This allows the occupant to have an efficient and balanced posture against the forces of gravity, minimizing the negative effects of the modern seated posture. Once this is achieved, the rest of the workstation should be set up to the occupant to achieve the best in health, well-being, and productivity.